Welcome everyone, my name is Denis Zhdanov and in today's video we are going to scratch on the surface of a very important, a large and profound topic of expressive and convincing piano playing. And in this video I'm going to share with you some very valuable insights which uh, I've heard from some of the leading artists, leading musicians in the field and sometimes those were just brief mentions of some topics, of some uh, tips, but nevertheless those tips have largely impacted my growth, my development as a musician. That's why I'm very happy about the uh, opportunity to pass the torch and hopefully help you to start some uh, exciting steps toward the major improvement in your piano playing. But before we continue, I would like to make a very short announcement. I have just released a four-hour intensive course on selected Bergmüller's Etudes, Opus 109, which are truly captivating and inspiring pieces. Within this course, I explain in great deal how to build several important skills to play the piano without tension, improve dexterity, work on a piece in stages, and of course, dive deep into interpretation and expressiveness to charm and move our audiences. You have just a few days to get this course with a 40% discount. The first skill needed for expressive piano playing seems to be very basic, very easy, but actually it's not. It's listening to the sound after the hit, because uh, there are, let's say, two waves of a sound. The first wave happens when the hammer hits the string. That's the first wave of a sound, let's say, the first blow. And then we have a second wave of how the sound actually evolves in the room and how the other strings resonate, if they resonate, and what happens in our perception when we listen to the lasting sounds. Let me illustrate this point with a small audio uh, editing cheating. So. So this is basically what you're listening to, how the sound evolves in the space. And this is a very important skill, although it seems very basic, but you have to do it for every note when you play piano, basically. That's the difficulty. You really have to train yourself to be able to follow each sound in its uh, horizontal length, let's say. And this would impact uh, the way you phrase, the way you organize your music, for example. I can play it more or less expressively because I can uh, focus on the length of the first beat and I can try to make it just a slightly longer. So this is an extra exaggerated version of what I try to feel, the length of the first beat and this makes this music uh, closer to the valse character with the emphasis of the first beat and it also makes the phrasing a bit more more expressive because I'm listening to the length of each note and particularly pay attention to the first beat. If I don't do this, then of course I have a more formal execution of the same spot. So this is the impact of the skill on your phrasing, let's say. One of the basic skills which uh, any musician has to build, has to acquire, is being able to define where my climax is and being able to clearly decide how do I move to that climax, how do I reach it, and what I do after that. And some of the best, most convincing artists you hear uh, who appeal to you, those are usually artists and not only, not as much artists who just play the right notes, those are artists who organize the musical flow in a very comprehensible and such a clear way that you don't have any choice, you have to be convinced by how they do this. Sometimes the structure of the piece is very evident, like for example here. So here's very uh, clear that we have two climaxes in bar four, in bar eight. However, we see that climax in bar eight would be more significant because not only we reach the top note, and this is by itself very important, like where you're the highest uh, pitch in the phrase, which usually defines where is the climax, but also in bar eight we have a uh, harmonic emphasis, so we have a shift in harmony. Mm. This is what we have in bar four and... Here we have what we have in bar 8, which seems larger, more dramatic, and that's why this climax in bar 8 would be more important. So we have two criteria 
in order to understand where is the most important spot in a phrase first uh, geographical positioning like where the uh, whether the melody goes up or down and usually when we go up we increase tension so the highest part usually it's your climax and the second criteria is harmonical emphasis so when harmony intensifies this also might uh, point on a climax but even when the spot is that straightforward when it's very evident where the climax is a good question is how do you actually uh, exit that climax because sometimes you might want to get out get off quite quickly by making diminuendo right after the climax for example and sometimes you might want to extend it to make it longer and even playing bar number five still staying at that emotional uh, plateau. And the general uh, observation which I see um, looking at the biggest artists, the most important musicians uh, of today and of the past, is that uh, great artists, once they have reached the climax, they try to get maximum out of it. They try to get all of it and um, stay on the top of emotional plateau for longer really making sure that they don't deflate too too quickly after uh, reaching the climax because this is a very usual uh, mistake uh, by less experienced players who reach the climax and they they, they are quickly deflating uh, kind of losing the interest losing the intensity and this is of course less appealing less convincing and this is also a very characteristic example because here Mendelssohn shows us with these Sforzangis that we really have to reach the top note of a climax because uh, when we don't have this indication this direct indication to mark the upper note, we usually tend to soften the very tip of the climax in the romantic music at least. And this is a general difference between largely a romantic tradition like Chopin, Debussy, Schumann, partially Liszt, Schubert, and classical music like Beethoven, Mozart, and, and stuff, because in a classical style or in Bach, we would reach the top note marking that climax in most of cases but in romantic music when we have a development or the climax we would rather like gently smoothen the very top of it so here what i'm doing i am creating a float toward the top note but I'm actually smoothing it because hitting those top notes uh, and marking them immediately you can you can hear that it's something off something is off style we would rather create a sensation of a flow toward the climax point but then release at the very top of it Another very important skill which basically draws a line between professional artists uh, who are very experienced in music and everyone else is, is directly connected to what we have started with, to the uh, skill of listening to the long note. Because when we have a situation like this one... You see that we first have a major leap, we have a lot of tension, so we would gently mark the uh, upper note. Then we are listening to that last note. And when we go to F, our task is to avoid an accent and impulse after this long note, because in piano playing, unfortunately, strings naturally do diminuendo. So after the hit, doesn't matter how strong I would hit that key, it would quite rapidly disappear. So when I proceed to the next note after a while, after a long note, I have to make sure that it's delicate, that it's not louder than what has left of that last note. This is not good because this F was louder than what has left of G. So in this situation, I really have to listen to that G and make sure that F is not louder than it. Which makes piano playing especially tricky, yeah, because you have to really manipulate with these dynamics in a very 
uh, tender way and make sure that important points like this G are supported enough, that they are embodied enough, because if I play this G with a too subtle sound, then it's very difficult to play F even softer. And the last concept for today, but not least, and maybe even one of the most important, is a concept of strong and weak bars. Because in some pieces we can organize the music, we can organize the musical flow by just simply following which bars are stronger, have more energy, and which bars are weaker have less energy. So let's have a look at this uh, sonata by Mozart uh, through the prism of this concept and just imagine that one bar is strong and the next one is weak and see what happens. It doesn't mean that I'm going to play forte piano, it just means that I'm going to treat the first bar a little bit more intensively and the second one a little bit less intensively, thus organizing music in pairs of bars and see what happens. So basically this organizes the musical flow pretty nicely and sometimes I can make it more evident, sometimes I can make it less evident, but this gives me a sensation of breathing in music. So it starts to evolve and breathe more naturally than if I treat each bar as a, like equally important. Sometimes we can push it further and differentiate which bars are stronger, stronger and which are just stronger. So for example, in this spot. I have two pairs of bars, so I would probably decide that uh, the first bar would be, let's say, strong as six, and second bar weak as three. Third bar strong as four, and the next one um, weak as two, for example. So we have six, three, four, two in levels of intensity. So six, three, four, two, even less one. suddenly hiding. So I hope this video was helpful. Stay tuned and of course check out my comprehensive uh, in-depth courses dedicated to the most important piano playing aspects and specific pieces following the link in the description. You can also contact me following another link in the description if you are interested in taking online piano lessons with me. Have fun playing piano and see you next time.